Okay, we are live on tape, which was one of my favorite lines from the Gary Sandling Gary uh, Gary Sandling show, or what was it? Gary Sandling, wasn't it? Remember that show? Uh, this is the Gary Chandler Sandling show. Chandling. Gary Chandler. Every intro was live on tape from Hollywood. Anyway, I I'm Jim Kukro from Author Marketing Club, and of course, Author Marketing Live, the event coming up. In a couple of weeks here, I have David Lawrence on the Hangout, who's one of our speakers. How are you, David? I'm good. I didn't set up my lower third so that it was like completely like awesome and David H. Lawrence the 17th, and you know, with a cool title and all that. I, you know, I just feel like everything that I do with you is awesome and on the fly. So, well, yeah. Well, you got to do it in today's world, you know, you just got to do it on the fly. I didn't set up my lower third either, but I think I it would be pretty cool right there, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, Dave, let me give you the bio from my website. It says, for over 30 years, David H. Lawrence, the 17th, right? Mm-hmm. Career has covered television, radio, podcasting, acting, entrepreneurship, and much, much more. You may know him from his award-winning syndicated radio show or his many acting appearance, appearances on shows like CSI, Mentalist, The Mentalist, Lost. I didn't know you were on Lost. I, what? I, I, never, watched, I never watched Lost. Good luck, Charlie, and of course his breakout role as one of the villains, puppet master Eric Doyle on NBC's Smash Hit Heroes. But did you know that David is a master voiceover actor and audio book creator with ACX? And David's going to be pr presenting a powerful session called Creating the Perfect ACX Audiobook Project that will show you how to turn your book into an audiobook that you can be proud of and profit from. So, David, very excited to have you at the show coming up in Cleveland. Well, I'm very excited to be coming back to Cleveland, which is where I grew up. And, uh, you know, I got, I got my start in radio at the Big 1220 WGAR, which is, I think, now a religious station or a, a sports station or something. Uh, in, the, in the day, it was the bomb. It was the station that the kid, kids were listening to. I remember, you know, finding out about uh, Dreamweaver by Aerosmith on the Big 1220. Uh, so, yeah, and I worked at WMMS, and I worked at G98, which is now WNCX, I think. Uh, I worked at WDMT, and at the time it was Disco 108 in Newberry, Ohio. And I used to drive from Bay Village, which was on the west side, all, it's still on the west side, right? Yeah, all the way over to Newberry, which is like in Pennsylvania. And every morning to do the, the morning, it was, you know, there was nobody on the road. It was just tedious. But... Yeah. It was great because I would get off the air. I, I would get off work at like, I don't know, 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning at the nightclub downtown and go home, take a shower, and then head to the station uh, for the morning show. So it was it was a life. Man, I was living in Ohio City. I had this gorgeous house. I'm so looking forward to coming back. Well, you know, you've paid your dues. Um, you've had an amazing career so far, and it just continues to grow and skyrocket. We were kind of talking about we were talking right before I started the broadcast about how you've reached a point in your career now where the gigs are kind of coming to you, right? And that's a really kind of a big benchmark point for anyone who's a content creator or an actor where yeah. people contact you now instead of you having to hustle and try and get stuff, right? Right, yeah. And in fact, there's a parallel between that and ACX. ACX is one of those sites that in the world of acting and, and uh, performance is called a... a, a pay-for-play site or a performance site or a, um, a casting site. All the others are truly pay-for-play. You have to pay a yearly fee to be listed on them and you have to wait for somebody to invite you to be uh, uh, an auditioner. Not right. so with ACX. With ACX, as a performer, I go every day looking for work and finding it. And what I'm going to try to do at Author Marketing Live is sort of present that process from our point of view and also for authors that want to be their own narrators, what it really takes for them to do a great job because there are some authors, I'm telling you, there are some authors that should not be doing their own work. And I'm not talking about independent authors, people that are attending your show. I'm talking about big name authors. I've said this a million times and I'll say it again. I would rather read a Stephen King book than listen to a Stephen King book because the moment he starts talking, I'm no longer scared. Right. So you got to be careful about, you know, you might have a great voice for writing, right? I mean, they, they say that I have a great face for radio, or they used to say right. that. <laughs> so, 
uh, you might have a great voice for writing. Um, that doesn't mean that your fans won't respond to you. So I want to talk about uh, the, you know, the way a project is put together on ACX and then real quickly uh, how to select uh, uh, a, uh, a narrator for ACX and then how to create an opportunity for yourself if you really want to narrate your own books, write them, narrate them. I mean, I teach this. I teach creating your own content. Write your ebook from from the uh, uh, voiceover perspective. Write your own ebooks, which is what I did with a series of books called Ten Quick Steps. When I used to be on the radio, I could answer questions poorly in about 90 seconds, which is what the average call lasts on talk radio. Uh, somebody would call up and say, "Hey, how do I back up my hard drive so I'm safe?" Okay, well, I can answer that question poorly in 90 seconds, but give me an ebook or an audio book that goes for about a half an hour and I can walk you through every single step of the way. So I created these whole series of books that I ended up selling while I was on the air. Like, you know, that's the, that's the quick answer. If you want the full answer, go grab 10 quick steps to a perfect backup. And I would do audio versions of them as well. And so, you know, I've been through that whole process since before ACX and Kindle and all that existed. So um, I, I have some lessons learned from that, that point. And then also exactly how to take your time and learn how to do this stuff and uh, or if you don't want to do it yourself learn how to pick properly uh, a, a, a narrator and I got a, a hint for you ahead of time it okay. doesn't involve asking your readers oh, okay. it does not involve asking your readers it doesn't involve saying to your readers hey who do you think should narrate this book here's some samples it doesn't involve that. Am I being clear? You can okay. do that if you want to, and I'll tell you why, but it's not going to give you the best results, and it'll be a great little publicity stunt for you and a great little way to connect with your listeners, which is what you're being coached to do when you do that. But in the end, you're, you're selecting talent by committee, and that happens in Hollywood every day, and it doesn't work very well. So right. I'm just going to give you the lessons learned there. Well, uh, there's a lot of different types of authors coming to the show. We've got uh, a bunch of them who have serials, have a bunch of books, and we have a lot of people who, who don't have uh, uh, books, and we have people who have one book, right? Yeah. And, like, I have ten books, and I have zero of them on ACX because I've never gotten to the point where I was going to go hire somebody to do that. And I write nonfiction marketing books, which you know, don't sell millions of copies. So it just hasn't been a high priority. However, I will tell you this, that my book that was through Wiley, the, the only book I traditionally published, um, I get the most comments and people contacting me from people who listen to the audio book from that. Yeah, it's a huge generator of connection to the audience because there's an intimacy to an audio book that just doesn't, uh, it just can't be it can't be underestimated. I mean, there's obviously a very strong connection between the written word, the physical book, the ebook, and the reader. But when you're living inside someone's ears for 10, 15 hours, uh, you create some memories that you just don't create when you give people uh, the carte blanche to create all of the the zeitgeist around a book by reading it. Now, I wouldn't want to trade the uh, experience of reading a book for anything, um, but I can tell you that when I consume an audio book, I am a much more attentive uh, consumer. Uh, I'm a more uh, avid uh, proselytizer. You know, um, another uh, set of uh, speakers at the event, uh, Johnny Truant and Johnny B. Truant and... Uh, and Sean. Um, help me. Sean, Sean. Sean. Um, you know, when I did their uh, when I did their hangout, we were talking about one uh, author as narrator in particular who was horrible. I mean, just absolutely horrible. Didn't care about the technical requirements. Didn't really give a crap about doing a good job. You know, just sort of like was himself, yeah. and it was fascinating. It was like listening to a train wreck. And so it can be a really cool experience, and it can be a very connective experience for your now not just reader but listener fan. And so I'm looking forward to talking to uh, authors about that. And you know, I think a lot of authors don't realize how big 
audiobooks are. And there's, in my opinion, there's been a big jump in the in the popularity of audiobooks. And not just your opinion; it's the truth. It's the facts. The data exists. Audible's hockey stick of uh, of uh, increase in demand is huge, and part of it is their effort to get every audiobook they have the rights to recorded. And that's what ACX is all about. But the technology, I thought, it was one of the biggest reasons as well, because we finally got to a point now where it's easier to get that audiobook onto a device that we can listen to it. And yeah. people listen to it in their car. You know, you can hook your phone right up to your Bluetooth through your car and play your audiobook. You don't have to get a CD. You don't have to plug <laughs> something in, right? It's. I always say, you know, the big magic uh, that Kindle had and still has is when you click that buy button and it creates that magic Willy Wonka dust and the Wonka vision and it delivers that book to your e-reader in mm -hmm. an instant, right? And yeah, that's what makes the audiobooks. Yeah. And and that's and, and that's starting to happen with audiobooks now. And on top of that, now with ACX kind of opening it up and allowing authors to be able to more easily create audiobooks either through a vendor like yourself, somebody who reads books or do it themselves, it's going to be huge, and every author needs to do this. Yeah, and it also creates a, a wonderful opportunity for me as someone who teaches this sort of thing. Uh, Dan O'Day and I, Dan is, Dan is a, uh, a radio uh, con, you know, consultant guru for decades. Like Dan is like 340 years old. He was, he was working in radio when we used to have to chisel things on the wall for people to listen to. Uh, he and I created a class called the ACX Masterclass, and uh, you know it's amazing how people will think, oh, it's easy because they say it's easy, and it is easy to a degree, but it's easy for that 80 percent. And then if you really want to polish yourself off, that last 20 percent is is really important in this particular case. And so uh, it presents a lot of opportunities to produce the work. It does, it's all a lot of opportunities to show others how to produce the work as well and you know it's a math problem to me other than the performance of the book there are some technical requirements that must be met and those seem to be the ones that people are most tripped up about what is root mean square normalization to minus 20 db what the hell is that you know and, and it just drives people crazy it's like w I don't know how to do that you expect me to I'm an author well I don't know how to do that well I'll show you how to do that it's pretty simple yeah, you know, I've got fifteen hundred bucks worth of podcast equipment sitting on this desk with a mixing board. And you don't board. need all that for an audio book. I, right. But I I bought it because I wanted to sound better and I wanted to make a better attempt at podcasting. But this is overkill. You don't need all of this equipment to record your own audio book, do you? Yeah. Is that an RE twenty sitting there in front of you? Uh, this mic, you mean, or what? What is that? It's a heel mic. Heel. Oh, the Heil. The Heil. Okay, great. Great. Yeah. They 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 tend to have like six or seven different looks. To a mic, uh, so that one looks like a pretty common um, uh, radio broadcast mic called the the RE20, the Electro Voice RE20. Uh, but the Heil mic is great, and that's a top load mic, right? You talk into the end of the mic. Yeah, uh, so that's why I'm kind of I'm supposed to be, you know. But since I'm on a video, I'm kind of talking. Okay. The way you're doing it right now is absolutely perfect. You're talking across the mic, and the mic is pointed at you at a 45 degree angle, so that you're not talking right into the mic where you can overdrive it. You're giving it the full fidelity of your voice without the full power, so your P's aren't popping and your F's aren't F'ing, and you, know, you, know what? you never want your F's to F. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, David Lawrence, David H. Lawrence gave me the endorsement. I am doing it correctly. I can't believe right. it. That's right. look great. It sounds great. The paper's in the background. That's kind of creepy, but... Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I usually... I usually I gotta clean up my desk, but I've been so yeah, yeah. busy. All right. I just read an article about how uh, creative people, the best creative people, are most creative in a messy environment. <laughs> if you could see the rest of my uh, studio, you'd go, "Wow, Jim's place is snappy." Well, uh, you know what I normally do? I have a stand-up desk here, and I I usually stand up when I do these, but I I forgot the call was coming so quick, I didn't have time to pull it up. That's but okay. I stand up cool. when I do. Yeah. If I so, stand, I stand up out of frame, so we don't want. Nobody wants that. Because so, they, but so, yeah, it doesn't need, you don't need all that equipment. I teach people, and I have people who have equipment in, who have uh, books in the ACX marketplace. That two hundred dollars worth of equipment is literally all you need if you have a quiet place in your home. 
and you can produce books to Audible's standards with only $200 worth of equipment. And that is just anathema to established audiobook narrators. I got so much crap from my peers in the business. They're like, what are you talking about? And I'm saying, remember, this is to get started. Right. You, you tell people yourself, don't go out and spend $10,000 on equipment and a whisper room and all that. Just get started. See if, you, see if you're going to do it. You can still produce with, with that stuff. So, And I'll That's show you. What it's all about is getting started. You know, I mean, the biggest things that hold people back from being successful is that first step of getting started. You've written the book. You want to take it to the next level with the audio book. And uh, at Author Marketing Live, David's going to show you how to do that. So, David, you've read uh, a lot of audiobooks. Uh, what are some any that we would recognize from? Uh, I know you did the one for After Earth. Yeah. That with Will Smith. Yes. Was... My friend came up to me. I was at Random House, and my friend came up to me after the movie came out. And he goes, "I think you had more listeners for the audiobook than you had people going to see the film." <laughs> But I love Will Smith. I love the movie. I love the book. The book was great. Um, I think the book that uh, you know a lot of people know me for now, if you've been following the NFL concussion crisis issue, yeah. it is called uh, League of Denial, and oh, yeah. it's a nonfiction book about. It's the companion book to the PBS Frontline uh, and originally ESPN co-branded documentary, but then the NFL forced ESPN to drop it to drop any association with it, or they weren't going to let them show the NFL games. That's kind of the intimation. That's how important and, and expensive this is for the NFL. But the problem is just insane. And now we're finding in all these other sports that uh, people are having uh, issues with uh, CTE, which is chronic uh, uh, something encephalopathy. Uh, yeah. I, I, I acquire information for the time that I need it, and then I let it go. I archive it to AWS. Um, but, uh, yeah, that book was really powerful. It was hard to get through some of the, like, you know, we're from Cleveland, so we're anti-Steelers, right? Uh, but, but actually, um, you know, uh, hearing about the Steeler players who were the first ones to have suffered from this, and to become uh, brain-addled from it and destructive with it, um, you know, and, and hearing about what happened during the autopsies and all that, it was just a, a, an amazing book. And to hear how the NFL just kind of, like, tried to push it under the rug, like, no, 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 it's, a, it, it's all voodoo science is what it is. And we're finding out it's absolutely not. And the recent events of the courts uncapping the benefits that players will get in the future from the NFL, not $785 million, which Betsy figured out was like 166000 per current, you know, victim. You know, we feel like the, the book, the audio book, the, the, um, uh, the documentary had a lot to do with making sure that the public was aware of it and that the players were aware of it and that the legislators were aware of it and it changed things. So your audiobook can be an agent for change, not just an agent for entertainment or, you know, scaring the bejesus out of somebody. Right. So uh, just a couple more things I want to chat with you about. We're going to talk about all this at the session, but... Yeah, i got 45 minutes to talk about it. Oh, okay. I'm going to be very efficient about it because I don't have time for questions. Well, uh, we, we're, we're taping this, so if anyone has a question, they'll have to ask you when they come to the show and meet you in person. Um, there is uh, a big... Everybody's scared to start an audiobook. I think cost is one of the big issues. Why? Um, well, let's talk about that. People not know about royalty share? Let's talk about that. I mean, the whole system works like a royalty share, right? But well, there's three, no, there's three ways that three ways. can be assigned. Okay. Um, okay. One is, I, I, you know, quickly, it doesn't have to cost you anything other than your time, and that usually is the most valuable thing that that uh, people don't get up front. It's like there's going to be time involved on the author's part to listen to the stuff, to approve it, to, you know, do that. And I'll show you how to be a good coach as well because most audiobook narrators have been doing this for a while, and um, they may have more experience in their area of expertise than you do in writing, especially if you're a new author. And 
they can help you uh, with the process. So let them do that. We, I teach them to hold your hand. I teach them to be your 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 go-to coach in this. But yeah, there's three ways of getting paid. Uh, per finished hour might be very expensive for you, um, but uh, royalty share doesn't cost you a thing. Well, here's what I'm worried. I think most authors, and I'm concerned about this too. If I'm a new author, I don't have a big following. How am I going to convince somebody like you, or maybe not you, because you're at the upper echelon tier? It's very important. Uh, uh, you know, somebody to want to read my book if they don't believe I'm going to be able to sell a lot of books. The same answer I'll give you uh, right now, a real brief intro to, is practice. Have a book that makes somebody go, "Oh my God, I don't care how many of these sell." Okay. This is an awesome book. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's the big elephant in the room. It's always the big elephant in the room when it comes to actors, when it comes to authors, any creative endeavor. Are you really as good as you think you are? Are you good enough to be competitive in the marketplace? Do you need to increase your skills in some way that make your content competitive? And if you can't answer that honestly, you really need to reassess what you're doing. There are people walking around thinking they are the best writers ever, and they are killing themselves. They are so deluded. And that's always something that people are unable and unwilling to talk about. But you have to. You have to look at, are you selling? Is what you're doing competitive in the sales marketplace, not just the art marketplace? And authors can be just like you know, uh, actors, I, I, I meet with actors on a regular basis for lunch just to sort of mentor them and coach them um, because somebody did that for me when I was getting started in radio and I was really, really helped by that. Uh, and I hear this all the time. I hear them saying, you know, I just, I'm not good at business and right. I don't want to be good at business because if I end up being good at business, my art will suffer. The artist cry out. Yeah, let me tell you something. Everybody you want to be as an author or as an actor, every Sandra Bullock and Tom Hanks and you know Stephen King and James Patterson, they're excellent business people. You can be guilt, you know, you can be jealous of them and say, oh, they've sold out. They've got people doing work for them. But no, they know how to do business. And there's a whole level under the A-listers that are also really good business people because they learned how to be good business people. Well, I so, think they, there's always, there, you know, in publishing, you know, book publishing, there's there's always been this romantic dream. I had it when I had my first book published in 2010. Oh, wow, I'm going to be with a publisher, and they're going to put my book in bookstores, and it's going to be displayed everywhere. This yeah. romantic dream you have, that success is just going to come because you signed with a publisher. And yeah. you created work, and you, you create good work, but there's still so much work you got to do on your own to find success, whether it's an audio book or any kind of work you're doing. I, I had a book out uh, that I wrote called Learn HTML on the Macintosh, and go look it up. It was the best-selling technical book of 1997, so I got that going for me. Uh, but I knew, I had a radio show at the time as well, and I knew that if I went to, like, Powell's Technical Books up in Portland and Borders, and Barnes, Barnes & Noble, and, you know, you name your poison, uh, Book Soup, uh, that I would draw a crowd in cities where my show was heard. And I presented that to Addison Wesley, which doesn't exist anymore. They folded into Pearson. And they're like, a book tour? For a technical book? So I go to Portland, 600 people show up, and they haven't sent but one case of the books. I... There's 20 books waiting for, for everybody. Luckily, they knew that, and I said that on the air. I said, don't trust that there's going to be enough books when I come see you. And, you know, people bought ahead of time, and they bought from other stores, and they brought the copies. But, yeah, I mean, publishers are unprepared or were unprepared for any sort of, you know, online promotion. You know, it just it was crazy, and it changed over the years. Now you hold virtual book tours via Google Hangouts, right? So, yeah. Uh, by the way, that sounded like a Dr. Cialdini trick there. You know, what? Come book, and then you only had twenty books when you got there, and then like, you know, some kind of scarcity. Oh, no, that, believe me, that was just that was just a sad, awful, horrible mistake on the part of the marketing department at Addison Wesley. I don't think anybody was going, huh? If we don't give the people that show up at this event a book, 
maybe they'll have a bigger demand and they'll go buy it on Amazon. No, <laughs> that wasn't what the case was at all. Oh, uh, that's funny. Um, all right, so look, this is going to be really great to have you there. Uh, I want to thank you personally again for coming out and doing this. My uh, pleasure. And um, uh, we've been uh, talking online for a long time. We've been in groups together, and I've been following your work. And I, I really want to stress to people who authors who haven't bought a ticket to the show yet to come on out and actually learn from this guy. Um, you don't get David to come speak. The reason I'm getting David to come is because he's from Cleveland, and I know him, and I asked him for a favor. It's it, This isn't like something that happens a lot. So you're going to get a lot from this. I'm, I'm, talking I'm, about happy, I'm happy to spend the opportunity cost on this. It was it was great. I, I said yes almost immediately. As soon yes. as I knew yeah. I didn't have anything, you know, the only thing that could, could possibly happen is, uh, you know, that part I'm up for with the new Steven Spielberg movie. Oh, really? No, no, no. I'll be there. You tried to scare the crap out of me or what? <laughs> 16 days out? Uh, well, you know what? I would not feel bad at all if you were going to go get a part in a Spielberg movie. So, um, yeah, uh, any last, last thoughts for an author who's, you know, uh, thinking about putting a book together on ACX? Um, obviously you want to tell them that they need to do that. This is an important part of their business of authorpreneur, correct? Yeah, and also don't be afraid to write for the ear. You know, Sean is doing something uh, pretty interesting. He's reading out loud his books, and actually uh, I'm going to be putting up a couple of uh, 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 posts, including uh, a video that we did, a Skype video that we did, where I kind of adjusted him in his space the way you are in your space. Uh, don't be afraid to write for the ear. Um, when you think about uh, how your characters sound in your mind, say it out loud. See how it sounds out loud. You might find some things that don't necessarily uh, work out as well as you thought, and some that will work out fantastic, but writing for the ear is what's made USA Today popular. It's what's made... Even, even the New York Times has moved towards writing for the ear, smaller chunks... Uh, and more potent uh, images. But, um, you know, authors have my immense respect because I have written, I've got about, I don't know, 45 books under my belt, mostly the 10 Quick Steps book. I hate it. Yeah. I hate the process. hate it. And I am so envious of people who love the process. I mean, when I, when I listen to uh, Do the Work and the uh, War of Art, I'm like, yeah, that's me. Resistance is sitting in my back pocket, you know. So, uh, you know, I, I'm just, I'm thrilled that you do this, uh, and I'm, and I'm honored to be coming. So, thank you. Well, it's gonna be great, and I really, again, thank you very much. Uh, come on out, grab a seat. We do not have many left. By actually, by the time that you uh, see this, it may be sold out. So, uh, go on over to AuthorMarketingLive.com. Check out David's bio. Uh, before we go, David, uh, where can people go to find out more about your master class or the things that you're doing? Uh, well, you can go to acxmasterclass.com. Uh, people that are not part of the class will find it uh, just sort of a very simple site that talks about what it is. But um, but if you want to get me, I'm at vo2gogo.com, vo, the numeral 2, gogo.com. And uh, you can find me on a television channel near you pretty much every day. So enjoy, because that's what Disney does. They hire you, and then they show you shows incessantly, which is great. Uh, on Friday you get a residual check, which is nice. That's great. Um, so uh, what's the, are you really up for a Spielberg film? No. No? No. Who's, no. Uh, before we go, who's your dream director to work for? I don't have a dream director to work no. for. I mean, I wish I did. I just, I don't. I have some people that I'd like to avoid, but uh, but for the most part, you know, I'm a performer whore. I mean, it's like, you know, you want me to be, you know, creepy, evil, villain, serial killer, I'm, I'm your guy. You want me to be that, that, you know, crazy neighbor next door, frat boy that never grew up, I'm your guy there too. You know, you it's like, it's like you're, you're in this business to help people realize their dreams, right? Writers always say, man, you came up with things that I didn't even know I wrote. 
And when you can get that kind of response to your work, when you can get people to say, you know, wow, I'm so glad we hired you because you did more than we expected in a good way, not like you really, you know, layered that with stuff we didn't need. Uh, it just, it just, it's just great. And so, you know, like I, I audition all the time for the craziest, weirdest, oddest things, um, and and sometimes even get them. So it's kind of nice. Did you ever audition for a Tarantino film? No. No. Here, it's kind of interesting. You know, you'll notice there are nobody but A-listers in Quentin Tarantino's films. I mean, there's no, there's no unknown. Uh, he goes after people who have high earnings, yeah. high Forbes bankability indexes, and uh, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind being in one of his films, but you know, it's like when people come to me to learn voiceover, I teach all the areas of voiceover. One of them is animation, and I get little girls or older girls with little girl voices saying, "I want to be the next Disney princess," and I say to them, "Okay, well, you got a big job ahead of you because you have to become an A-list star now." First, yeah. you know, yeah. Frozen, Kristen Bell, she's the new Disney princess, and she's the new Disney princess because she puts butts in the seats, not because right. she's got this cute little voice, because she doesn't have a cute little voice. She has a gorgeous voice, right? So people come in for the strangest reasons, but, you know, I've been really fortunate in that I have really paid attention to the business side as well as the art side, and so I have plenty of opportunities, and I'm grateful for that. All right, well, uh, I've taken up enough of your time. I want to thank you again, again, again for coming out to Cleveland and taking the time to do this. It's sure. going to be amazing. I can't wait because I need to read my latest book, uh, Go Direct. I need to read that and put it up on ACX because, um, hey, I got the equipment. You know, I right. got the equipment I need. I need to do it myself. And fortunately, I write like I talk, so uh, it's an easier read for me. But, uh, again, thank you, David. And uh, we will see you in Cleveland on uh, September 8th. You got it. All right, everybody, go on and check out acxmasterclass.com. And uh, if you have any questions for David, I suggest you go grab a ticket and come actually meet David and ask him in person and, and beg, beg, beg him to read your audio book, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe, he'll, maybe he'll read the content like he said and say, wow, this is a really good book. Maybe you'll get... David to read your audiobook, but no no promises, David. Um, all right, thank you again. Have a great day, and we'll see you in Cleveland on September 8th for Author Marketing Live. Thanks, David.